We are here on the day of Pentecost, the second of the three annual festival seasons that God ordained in the Scripture. And it is appropriate that we focus in on some things that tie in very directly uh, to the meaning of this particular festival. There are many, many aspects to go into. If we were to look at the book of Psalms, we would find, if you do check in a commentary, or even some Bibles are marked in that way, you will find that the Jews have traditionally recognized the book of Psalms as consisting of five sections or five books. Uh, they refer to it as the five uh, book of the, the books of the Psalms, and the Psalms, of course, very long, and, and uh, it was uh, many, way, many times kept that way in terms of the scrolls. But uh, uh, the first 41 Psalms constitute the first book of the Psalms, then beginning with Psalm 42, and uh, uh, going, uh, uh, going on from there, we, we uh, get into the uh, Psalm 42 through 72, we get into the second uh, book of the Psalms, and then uh, the third book starts in Psalm uh, 73, and uh, uh, comes on up to Psalm 89, uh, Psalm, 80, uh, Psalm 90 begins the fourth book. Uh, which uh, uh, continues on up then to uh, uh, Psalm 104 and, and beginning, or Psalm 106, excuse me, uh, in the fourth book, the fifth book begins with Psalm 107 and goes to the end. Now, one of the things that the, the Jews drew, drew several conclusions from this, they drew several analogies uh, from the five books of the Psalms, the five uh, divisions, traditional divisions of the book of Psalms, one of the analogies that they drew was to correspond the five divisions of Psalms, the five books of Psalms, uh, with the five books of the Torah, the five books of Moses, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And they drew certain parallels between the, these five sections of Psalms, paralleling them uh, to some of the message and some of the content of the five books of the Torah. There was also a third uh, or a second comparison they drew, a third set of five, a second comparison of these five books of Psalms, and that is that they also drew a comparison uh, to what are termed the five books of the Megalot. Now, the Megalot was the five festival scrolls, consisted of Song of Solomon, Ruth, uh, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, and Esther. These five books, five festival scrolls, were traditionally read at five festival occasions, three of which corresponded to the three major uh, festival seasons or holy day seasons that God ordained, and two of which corresponded to national uh, holidays that are mentioned or referenced in the scripture and yet were not a part of the holy days that God commanded for ancient Israel. They're not a part of what we celebrate in the church today. They're not a part of what is listed in Leviticus 23, but they were national days that reflected in on God's working in the life of the nation of Israel, and there's certainly parallels. And these books were traditionally read at those occasions. Song of Solomon uh, traditionally read at the Passover Unleavened Bread festival season. The Book of Ruth traditionally read at Pentecost. Lamentations uh, traditionally read uh, during the summer uh, on an occasion known as the Fast of Ab, or the ninth day of the fifth month. This was the day that uh, was originally the anniversary of Nebuchadnezzar's destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. And... Uh, was observed by the Jews as a day of national mourning and fasting, uh, and is still so observed by traditional Jews to this day. Uh, the book of Ecclesiastes was read at the Feast of Tabernacles in the fall, and, and the book of Esther was read uh, at a, an occasion, a national holiday, sort of like a uh, combination Thanksgiving, Fourth of July, uh, that uh, is known as Purim which had to do with the deliverance of the Jews in the time of Persian rule. The story is given in the book of Esther. And there are points and analogies that can be drawn on each of those. And each of those books has, uh, each of those five festival scrolls has a message that focuses in and that deals with uh, certain 
thing that God wants us to understand about each of these occasions. And as I mentioned, the Jews, not only in focusing on the festival scrolls, as they would traditionally have gone through at this occasion, but there was also, they drew a parallel with the five books of the scrolls. That would, of course, mean this being the, the time of Pentecost, the time when the uh, second festival scroll, the book of Ruth, would normally have been read in the synagogue. The parallel in the Psalms would be the second book of the Psalms, beginning in Psalm 42. It's interesting, that particular section of the Psalms, how much of the material in it certainly corresponds with the uh, message of Pentecost. Uh, we're not going to go into great depth, but I do want to call your attention to at least a couple of the Psalms there. But you can notice uh, some of the parallels and other things. You go back, uh, for instance, to the Psalm 22, most of which uh, is very prophetic of uh, Christ's crucifixion and the events that transpired. That, of course, would be in that first section of the Psalms, the one that parallels uh, the uh, First festival, Passover, unleavened bread season. So there are many various parallels you could go into. But uh, Psalm 42 sets the stage for the second book of the Psalms. And it starts out in Psalm 42, verse 1, As the heart pants after the water brooks, so pants my soul after you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Psalm 42 starts out with an expression of one of the most critical needs and longings that humanity has. It is expressed in the analogy of a thirst, a deep thirst for what God has. Now, as we go through and examine this morning, I would like for us to focus in on this critical longing that humanity has and how God intends that longing to be fulfilled. The psalmist starts out by describing himself under the analogy of an animal who is panting after water, who is thirsty. He was anxious to find fresh, clear water. And he describes that as the analogy of his longing, his yearning for what God has to do, for what God has to offer. He says, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. There is a deep thirst. That deep thirst is the critical longing, that critical need. In Psalm 63, also in the section of the Psalms, in verse 1 it says, O God, you are my God, early will I seek you, my soul thirsts for you, my flesh longs for you in a dry land, a dry and thirsty land where no water is. To see your power and your glory as I have seen you in the sanctuary. Again, a description of a longing, a need for God, Early will I seek you, my soul thirsts for you. A deep thirst, a thirst that is unquenchable by any other means. A thirst for God, that thirst is equated, that deep thirst is equated with longing, with a desire for what God has to offer. Now if we were to go back to the book of Jeremiah chapter 2, we find that God has an indictment against his people, against his people nationally. And he starts out in, Saul, in Jeremiah chapter 2, in verse 3, he brings out that Israel is holiness under the eternal, the first fruits of his increase. From the standpoint nationally, Israel was God's starting point, the first fruits, the very concept of first fruits carries with it the connotation that that's a starting point. Israel represented the first fruits nationally, just as spiritual Israel, the church, represents God's first fruits spiritually. And this 
festival that we're here to observe today is traditionally called in the Old Testament the Feast of First Fruits Harvest or the Feast of Weeks. We normally use Pentecost as the a term by uh, which we refer to it, uh, because that is the term that's most commonly used in the New Testament. It uh, is the Greek term that corresponds with the Feast of Weeks. It just makes reference to the fact that there's a 50-day count or a seven-week count uh, between the way chief during the Days of Unleavened Bread up to this time. It celebrates the harvest of the first fruits. And there are many scriptures and places in the New Testament which we could go uh, that focus in on how we as God's people today represent a kind of first fruits of his increase. But notice on down in verse 13 of Jeremiah 2, he says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and they hewed them out cisterns broken systems that can hold no water. Now, two problems that God brings out, both of which are related to the to the filling of that deep crystal leaf. Both of which are related to the quenching of that deep thirst. The problems that God brings out is one, forsaking them, God describes himself as the fountain of living waters. He describes himself, uh, by analogy here, as an artesian well. Living water, flowing water, water of life. We draw the comparison between the fountain of living waters, between uh, a beautiful flowing artesian well, and a cistern. Not only a cistern, but a broken cistern. Now, a cistern is not, of course, a source of water by itself. A cistern has to be filled. But a broken cistern, no matter how much you put into it, it's never filled because it has a leak and it loses what is put in. The broken cistern can't hold water. Now, what God recognizes, what he indicts the people for, is not for being thirsty, not for having that longing, not for having that critical need. What God's indictment has to do with is false strategies for coping with that need, false strategies for fulfilling. Broken cisterns are equated here to the false strategies of coping that human beings develop. And there are many, many different ones. Humanity is recognized through the, through the centuries, through the time, uh, in all of the, the various uh, societies and cultures that man has developed, there has been a need. There has been a deep need, uh, a deep spiritual longing. And various societies, various cultures have developed different ways of doing that. Uh, there are a variety of substitutes. There are counterfeit spirituality. There is counterfeit spirituality. You know, the Pharisees had one version of it. To them, you know, to them, what spirituality consisted of was following the rules. It had to do with external conformity. Religion was something you sort of put on and off. You put it on, and you wore it, and then you hung it up, put it away, got it out the next week. Uh, it had to do with an external conformity to the rules. Now, Christ talked about the Pharisees, he talked about their hypocrisy, and in the Sermon on the Mount, he told his disciples, he said, Unless, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will in no wise enter into the kingdom. Now, what did he mean by that? Did he mean that you have to keep the Sabbath more meticulously than they did? That you have to tithe more scrupulously? Those were not the problems for which they were indicted. But, you see, their, their coping mechanism, their, their concept of spirituality was simply going through and conforming to the rules. There are various types of religions that are very ritualistic, very rule-bound, and everything is done a certain way. Uh, certain religions uh, go in quite a bit for a lot of ritual, a lot of ceremony, a lot of 
uh, of emphasis is given to the way certain things are done in a purely external manner. And there's a lot of talk, there's a lot of ceremony, and sometimes people uh, may have a certain feeling, and they think, well, boy, that's good, you know, I really, I, I felt to this peace, because, you know, I came in there, and, and the room was dim, and it looked, uh, it, all, everything was just, uh, you know, a certain way. Here was this uh, incense smell, and here was this, and here was that, and, and, and they have this concept that that uh, is, is where they do uh, some sort of spirituality. So you, you have, on the one hand, a concept, the concept that the Pharisees practice, the concept that many others have, uh, they just may use slightly different rules, but a concept that views the, the way of filling that spiritual void as external conformity to the rules. You obey the rules. You externally conform to the things uh, that are expected. You follow certain rituals. You do certain things certain ways. Others uh, have a different approach. There are those for whom emotion is a substitute of spirituality. There are various religions in the pagan world that went in for that, just as there are various ones uh, in our modern world that did. If you go back and you read the story of the confrontation between Elijah and the priests of Baal, now you find that the priests of Baal really got into it. I mean, they were uh, they, they were jumping up and down and whooping and falling over, uh, and uh, uh, they, they really uh, uh, were coming under the spirit, at least as they thought. Uh, and it describes, you know, you go through, I'm not going to turn, for the sake of time, I'm not going to turn back and go through the account uh, in detail, but you're, you're aware of it back, uh, uh, back in Kings, uh, back there in First Kings, where it describes uh, Elijah and the priests of Baal, and Elijah's confrontation with them, uh, and uh, the, the things that are going on, and they were uh, trying to get Baal's attention. And it described them jumping up and they were uh, falling over and they were, uh, you know, singing and shouting and, and and even before it was over with, they were cutting on themselves with knives and they were uh, just doing all sorts of things. And Elijah was sort of helping things out by uh, saying, uh, why don't you speak up? I, I don't think he can hear you. You know, well, I'll tell you what, maybe he's, he's off the I bet he's talking to somebody else, you know, just keep going, guys. Maybe he's on a hunt, or maybe he pursues. Uh, and uh, so he went into various things, which uh, I'm sure they did not particularly appreciate at the time. Other various accounts you read, that was not unique to them. You come on down to New Testament times uh, in the Hellenistic world, various religions, particularly uh, uh, some of the ones, uh, some of the mystery religions, uh, got into quite a bit of uh, uh, emotional charismatic displays. Uh, the oracles, for instance, the oracle at Delphi, uh, one of the great uh, famous oracles of the, uh, of the Greek world, was quite renowned uh, when uh, uh, people would come to inquire of her, uh, the uh, priestess of Apollo there at Delphi. And uh, she would, uh, the priests would uh, beat on the tambourines, and they would uh, uh, clang the cymbals, and they would uh, really kind of, uh, well, the equivalent of what would be termed today, uh, kind of pray down the spirit. Uh, some of you who come out of those backgrounds uh, understand what I had reference to. You, you know, if you come out of a background like that, you felt right at home uh, with the oracle at Delphi, because this was, a, she really got into the mood there, and eventually would uh, kind of work out to, to give to, to give rise to ecstatic utterance, uh, as it was termed. She would uh, begin to babble and fall over and, 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 and babble out all this gibberish. And, and of course, everything had been really worked up to a frenzy. And the priests would then serve as interpreters. They would tell you what she said, supposedly the voice of the God speaking through her. And of course, they usually gave some sort of enigmatic answer uh, that uh, could, could mean anything. When one king came to inquire the oracle at Delphi as to what would happen if he attacked the Persians, and he was told, you know, that, that uh, if you were to go and attack the Persians, a great empire would be destroyed. Well, that sounds that sounded pretty good. Well, he went charging off to attack the Persians, and, and here he was wiped out. Well, the great empire was destroyed. It's his. Uh, and, you know, so you can kind of cover it both ways. You see, you can uh, give some sort of enigmatic answer, and people can read into it in the aftermath or whatever they want. But 
down through the centuries, their new for whom emotion has been a substitute spirituality. It is, it is a counterfeit spirituality, uh, equating human emotional feelings. Now, we all have emotions, and we all have feelings, and, and that's fine, just as, as, as following rules is fine, but neither are substitutes for real spirituality. Neither are going to fill uh, that void. There are, there are various things that, uh, there are various ways people have sought to, to, uh, to fill the void. There are many broken systems. There are many fast coping strategies. We live in a, in a society today that uh, is very uh, preoccupied with self. You know, when Paul went to Timothy, uh, that know you this, and in the last days, uh, he starts describing characteristics, and one of the things he zeroed in on was men shall be lovers of their own selves. People preoccupied with self. The term narcissism is sometimes used, uh, hearkening back to uh, Greek mythology, the, the uh, uh, character Narcissus, who, who uh, gazed into the stream and saw his own reflection and was so enamored of... Uh, uh, of himself, you know, just in love with himself, and it finally fell in and drowned. So, uh, you know, that's what happens if you fall in love with yourself. You become so preoccupied with self. Are we live in a society where people are preoccupied with self, and some of the things that are done are not wrong. Robin, by themselves, it's not wrong to be health conscious. Uh, it's not wrong to, to exercise or to be careful of other food you eat, or uh, any number of things are fine. In, in proper balance and proper understanding, but when people become obsessed with something that their whole life uh, just revolves around the self, and and they're just and so somehow if they just pamper this physical body that everything forever is going to be okay. Well, many modern philosophies and attitudes focus in on this, and they. Uh, that they um, really can represent false coping strategies uh, because it's not uh, simply a matter of uh, uh, these broken systems. They can hold no water. They're not going to provide what's needed to quench the thirst. You, you know, in terms of quenching thirst, it's sort of an interesting analogy uh, that uh, God draws in that regard back in Ephesians. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, familiar scripture, uh, he says, Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, you know, there are, there are those who try to quench their thirst uh, uh, in, in any number of ways. Of course, one of the, one of the broken sisters, one of the false coping strategies, and uh, certainly then uh, what is uh, described right there, Ephesians 5, 18. Uh, today, of course, we have a whole... Uh, wide uh, a range of things that uh, not only, uh, uh, you know, wine or alcohol, but a whole range of uh, hosts of pills and drugs uh, that really have as their purpose to help people change the way they feel. They help them change the way they feel. It becomes a, it, it becomes a coping mechanism. It becomes a, a means of trying to, to change the way they feel. Trying to fill the thirst, because they're trying to fill the void. You see, the problem is you can't fill a spiritual void with a physical substance. You can't fill a spiritual void with a physical substance. And it doesn't matter what the physical substance is, any physical substance is going to be insufficient. Ultimately, it comes down to broken cisterns. Broken cisterns that can hold no water. The, the thrust, as we, as we open here, as we see in the book of Psalms, and even the number of the Psalms in this second section of the Psalms that would normally correspond to uh, the book of Ruth or to the festival of Pentecost and, and uh, traditional uh, understanding by the Jews, the, the very opening comment has to do with a deep thirst. We are here to celebrate the day that holds the key as to how that thirst is going to be assuaged, how that thirst is going to be quenched. And it's not going to be quenched 
by pouring more water in a broken cistern. Because no matter how much water you pour in a broken cistern, it all drips out. It runs away. And it does not solve the problem. There is no human power that can solve the problems of which we're speaking. There's no physical substance that can fill that spiritual void. Jesus Christ came talking about how that deep thirst could be assuaged. In John chapter 4, we have an account of Jesus traveling through the area of Samaria. And uh, he had left Judea, was departing again to Galilee, uh, going up south to north, and he went through Samaria rather than going around. The Jews uh, had great distaste, had no dealings, so they could avoid it with the Samaritans. But Jesus went up this way, and he met a woman uh, at, the, they came to a village of the Samaritans, and Christ had an exchange with a particular woman. Uh, we read of this exchange here in John chapter 4. It's sort of interesting. There uh, is an indication of a time setting uh, in John chapter 4 uh, that I might just call your attention to that is sort of interesting and uh, corresponding to the subject matter that is carried in John chapter 4 and the material today. Um, Jesus, in talking to his disciples when they uh, came back from the village, they'd gone in to get something to eat. And uh, uh, they, Jesus made a statement. They didn't understand exactly what he meant. They had a way of taking everything in a very literal sense uh, when many times Christ had a spiritual content to a point that he was trying to get across. And so, in verse 34, John said, breaking into the context, he said, My me. My food is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Don't you say, there are yet four months to harvest. Four months and then comes harvest. And I say unto you, look, lift up your eyes, look on the fields, they're white already, a harvest. Now, there were two harvests uh, in ancient Israel, the spring harvest and the fall harvest. The festival that we're here to celebrate is the First fruit harvest and spring harvest began Passover season and concluded with this day, uh, concluded prior to this with the early grain harvest. The grain harvest, the festival that is all that is called the feast of in gathering, the great gathering in harvest, uh, the great fall harvest was celebrated, of course, in the seventh month. Uh, the feast of tabernacles representing the highlight of that. Well, it's sort of interesting that if he had reference here when he made the statement, you say there are yet four months to harvest. Harvest is four months away. If the ingathering harvest, the great harvest of the seventh month is that to which he is referring, then four months prior to that would be the third month. Four months prior to the seventh month is the third month, the beginning of the third month. Normally, Pentecost comes in the first in the first week of the third month. So, it is very likely, uh, I think, based on this statement as well as simply the subject matter, that he was certainly in that season uh, of the year. Not that this was spoken on Pentecost, but certainly the content that is delivered here is very appropriate to this season. Because what Jesus said to the woman at the well in Samaria in chapter 4, verse 10 of the book of John, he said, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that said to you, Give me the drink, you might have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Now back in Jeremiah 2, God said there are two evils. My people have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and they viewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. Jesus said, if you knew who I was, you would have asked me, and I would have given you living water. Now, the woman didn't know what he was talking about. She said, well, sir, this is a pretty deep well. You don't have anything to draw up with. Where are you going to get this water from? Are you greater than our father Jacob, which gave us his well, and drank thereof with himself, his children, his cattle, 
And Jesus said, you know, if you drink this water, you're going to get thirsty again. This water is not going to really quench the deep thirst to which I have reference. But whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into eternal life. So here we have a spiritual water. Now, there goes on as an exchange between the two. And Jesus makes this point of the living water and the fact that uh, in verse 24 that God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Now if we're going back to John 7, Jesus here speaking on at the conclusion of the Feast of Tabernacles, in fact on the last great day, in John chapter 7 and verse 37, says, In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. For he that believes on me, as the scriptures have said, out of his belly, out of his innermost being, down at the very core of his innermost being, shall flow rivers of living water. Rivers of living water, a great artesian spells, a great artesian well springing up. Rivers of living water. This he spoke of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now the time is going to come when all humanity will have the opportunity to draw water out of the wells of salvation. There's even a uh, reference to that in the book of Isaiah. And all humanity will have the opportunity, and that, of course, is what the last great day symbolizes, the time when all humanity will have the opportunity to, with joy, draw waters out of the well of salvation. When the water, the living waters will be made available to all humanity. Now, the living waters hadn't yet been avail made available, but he's talking about the same thing that he was discussing with the woman at the well in Samaria months earlier. He was talking about the Holy Spirit. This he spoke of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit was not yet given. Jesus himself had not yet been crucified, resurrected, ascended to the Father on high. But he was talking about the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God which is compared here to rivers of living water. The means, the only means, by which that deep, insatiable thirst, that deepest, most critical longing and thirst in human beings can be fulfilled. Not by the broken cisterns, the broken systems that can't even hold water if you put water in. Here is water that comes from the source of water that comes forth from God. The psalmist recognized the deep thirst for the waters of life, for those rivers of living water, for the Holy Spirit of God. And that second section of Psalms opens with that focus. Jesus Christ held out the solution. Now there is a process of meeting that need. There is a need. There is a solution. There is a source of meeting that need. And there is a way to go about applying that solution so that the need is met. Now, in the book of Acts chapter 2, the Apostle Peter is preaching a sermon here on this very day. We're here today, 1960 years to the day after Peter spoke the words that are recorded right here in Acts chapter 2. We're here 
on the uh, 1960th anniversary, uh, if you will, of the occasion described here in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 and verse 1, we're told that when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. That's what we are. They're all here in one accord in one place. Now, this particular day of Pentecost was unique because this particular day of Pentecost marked the inauguration of the New Testament era. This marked the beginning of the New Testament church. This marked the beginning of making the New Covenant. So the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, under the Old Covenant, God wrote, we were told this back in Hebrews 8 and other places, you know, God wrote with his own finger on tables of stone, he wrote his law. Under, under the Old Covenant, the, the, the Ten Commandments, the two tables of stone were kept in the Ark of the Covenant. And it was the law of God written with the finger of God on tables of stone. We're told, as God prophesied through Jeremiah and Paul further expounded in the book of Hebrews, God says, the day will come that I will make a new covenant. Not according to the covenant that I made with the people when I brought them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke. For according to the fault was them. The fault was not with God. The fault wasn't God made a mistake. The fault was the people. Finding fault with them, God says, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days. I will put my laws into their hearts and into their minds, and I'll be to them a God and they'll be to me a people. Under the new covenant, God is writing his law in our heart through the power of his spirit. God pours out his spirit, and that spirit is the means of transforming us, it is the means by which God transforms the way we are on the inside. And God writes his law. Not with his finger in a table of stone, but with his spirit in the table of our heart. So here was Peter on this day of Pentecost, this day that inaugurated the, the beginning of the process of making a new covenant of God pouring out his spirit and beginning to deal with people in this way. And he gave a very strong sermon that left the audience that was hearing it, a substantial portion of them, deeply convicted. Because as he moved to the conclusion of his sermon in chapter 2 and verse 36, he said, Now let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts. It cut to the quick. And they said, Under Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? They were deeply convicted, deeply caught by what he said. And they knew it was true. And they said, well, we've already done it. What, what can we do? We can't turn back the clock. You know, which of your sins can you undo? Oh, if there's a human being that lives, that doesn't wish he could go back and somehow relive certain times, certain periods. That somehow we could do certain things differently. None of us have any choice about our past. You can't choose your past. You just can't. You can't choose your parents. You can't choose your family. You can't choose your past. You can't choose yesterday. You have no choice whatsoever about yesterday. Whether well, it was good, bad, or indifferent, you have no choice about yesterday. Yesterday is history. You can't get in a time machine and go back and relive yesterday. We have no choice about yesterday, but we do have choices beginning with today. That's why the scripture says, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart, as in the day of provocation, Paul says in Hebrews. Today, if you will hear his voice, our choices start with today. They don't start with yesterday. The people were convicted, and they said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, Acts 2.38, Repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For this promise is unto you and to your children, 
Longer or far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. That comes right on down to us today. They said, what shall we do? And Peter said, repent and be baptized and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now Jesus Christ compared the Holy Spirit to rivers of living water springing up down in our inner, the innermost depth of our being. The source of quenching the unquenchable thirst. The means of filling the spiritual void and the emptiness. Jesus Christ didn't offer a broken system. He offered a river of living water. He offered the Holy Spirit of God. The means by which that can be gained is explained right here in Acts 2.38. Now let's go back to Psalm 55. Or not Psalm, but Isaiah 55. Let's notice what Isaiah said. It corresponds very much, perhaps a little more detailed exposition, of the point that Peter made on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 1, it says, Ho, everyone that thirsts, come you to the waters. You thirsty? You have a deep need? You know, at the beginning of the sermon, I took a drink of water. I'm thirsty again. Now, I can take another drink of water, but if I keep on talking, I'll drink up all the water. And, you know, I'll still get thirsty again. But, Jesus Christ talked about a water, a living water. As he told the woman at the well in Samaria, and he said, the water that you have, someone drinks it, they get thirsty again. It doesn't solve the problem in the real and the ultimate sense. Not in the sense that he meant, because obviously he was using uh, a, a spiritual analogy, but he said, the water that I offer, Whosoever drinks of that will never thirst. Isaiah 55 says, Come to the Lord that thirst. Come to the water. He that has no money, come you. Buy and eat. Yes, come and buy wine and milk without money and without price. Here's an invitation to come and to drink. To come and to fill that deep thirst. Notice in verse, chapter, in verse 6 what Isaiah says. He says, Seek you the Lord while he may be found. Call you upon him while he is near. How do you do that? Verse 7. Let the wicked man forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord. And he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he you will abundantly pardon. Now, the word return here is a word. That is one of the most common words in the Hebrew Old Testament. The uh, word, of the, the root word in the Hebrew, uh, shub, which is a word that means to return or repent. It's the term that is used for repentance, which literally means to turn around, to turn back to God, to return. It is the it, it is a word that's used over a thousand times in the Old Testament. It is one of the most commonly used words. And it is a word that expresses what real repentance is. Real repentance is not simply remorse. It's not simply contrition. It's not uh, simply a, a form of penance. You know, some of you come out of a religious background where you, uh, you, you know, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. So he gives you an act of contrition. Now, some of you are very familiar with that. Well, that's not what real repentance is. The term repentance the, the really originates here in the Old Testament that the, what's used in the New Testament was, was influenced by uh, the, uh, uh, the sense of the word in Hebrew, which has to do with a turning around, a turning back to God. Things of certain outward uh, evidence of, of remorse or contrition, what does God say? He says, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Now there are two things talked about here. What we do and what we think. 
Because you see, ultimately, what I do is a reflection of the way I feel and the way I think. So, you, you see, simply external conformity to the rules is not enough. God is after something far more, far deeper, far more profound out of us than simply external conformity to rules. Now, that doesn't mean that you ought to just go out Religion had to do simply with, with external things they did do and didn't do. It didn't have anything to do with an inner transformation of the way we are. And what God is after in us goes far beyond simply the external conformities and changes. It has to do with an inner transformation. It's not enough simply to outwardly conform what God desires in our behalf is an inward transformation from the power of His Spirit. And what you have to do, you start with what you're doing. Yes, you know, let the wicked forsake His way. It's, uh, you, you've got to make a change. How do you start returning? You see, it says, Seek you the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He's near. If you're thirsty, come to the waters and drink. The way you do it is you seek God while He can be found, you call upon Him while He's near. How do you do that? Well, you've got to turn around and go the other way. You stop doing things you shouldn't do, but that's not where, that's not where you stop, that's where you start. Because ultimately what we have to do is get down to the way we think. See, the unrighteous man has to forsake his thoughts. Wicked has to forsake his ways, he has to forsake his thoughts. We have to realize that not simply what we do is the better problem of what we think we do. Well, we quit doing this and start doing that. But the whole reason that I do it, the whole reason that I do it, gets back to the way I think and feel on the inside. The things I do outwardly are a reflection of the things I think and feel. And you see, God says, we need to return unto him, we need to repent. And he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. So, you see, God is ready to extend mercy, he's ready to extend pardon. God is merciful, God is forgiving. But he says in verse 8, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. The reason we have to forsake our thoughts and our ways is because our thoughts and our ways are not the thoughts and ways of God. He says, my thoughts aren't your thoughts. The reason we have to forsake our thoughts is because they didn't originate with God. You see, ultimately, the way I feel, my, my feelings are simply an, an emotional response to the things that I believe deep down inside. Things I believe. Any feeling that I may have, whether it's joy or sadness or, or anger or fear, ultimately, those feelings are not based nearly so much on reality as they are based on what I believe reality to be. You know, if I were to make an announcement, somebody were to come up here and hand me a note, and I were to make an announcement that the building is on fire, you know, you would have certain feelings that would uh, immediately rise up. It wouldn't really matter whether you liked it or disliked it, uh, you, there are certain ways you would feel. Uh, fear being probably uh, somewhere near the top of the list. Uh, you know, uh, now, maybe it was a practical joke or somebody's idea of a practical joke. Uh, maybe it, it, there was no truth to it. That didn't determine how you felt. The truth or falsity of what I said isn't what would determine how you felt. Whether you believed what I said would determine how you felt. Now, the point is that the thoughts we have, the way we think and feel, has to be changed 
by exchanging our thoughts and feelings for God's thoughts and feelings, or the way that God is, because God's thoughts and our thoughts are not the same. You see, we've all accepted and believed certain lies. Because we live in Satan's world. And Satan is a liar and the father of a lie. And we've grown up in Satan's world. And we've been influenced and affected by the lies Satan tells. Now, Jesus Christ came to bear witness of truth. And the word of God is truth. It is the basis by which our thoughts can be scrubbed, our beliefs can be changed. And that we come to identify and to recognize that certain things that we have accepted are not true. See, ultimately it comes down to you've got a choice. Who's really going to think for it, God's or the devil's? I mean, that's really what it, when you, when you boil it down to the bottom line, you got to, who's one do you accept? God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. The heavens are higher than the earth, my ways are higher than your ways, my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain comes down from, down the snow from heaven, returns out there, but it waters the earth and makes it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the soil and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void, it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing where I, where to I stand. Jesus Christ said, John 17, 17, thy word is true. Thy word is true. God's word is true from the beginning. God's word is the source of truth. The source of changing our thoughts and our beliefs has to get back to what God says. An inner transformation, a replacement of our thoughts with God's thoughts. You know, we could go through the this term return here that uh, I called your attention to in Isaiah 55 and verse 7. It's the term that is used, for instance, back in the book of Ruth, uh, several places where, uh, for instance, uh, uh, in, in uh, Ruth chapter 1 and verse 16, where Ruth said to Naomi, in, uh, Naomi had said to, to Ruth in verse 15, uh, your sister is gone, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people. And she's gone back into her gods. She's turned back. She's turned away. She has started out. But you see, Naomi, uh, there's certainly an analogy here in, in the sense of uh, uh, Naomi being analogous to, to the church and, and Ruth, to the uh, individual Christian here at the beginning that uh, uh, as, as Ruth was told to count the cost. And of course, so it was, uh, uh, so, was, so, was, so was Orpah, her sister-in-law. They were told to count the cost, to realize what they were forsaking as they prepared to leave Moab and go to Judah. And when they were told to count the cost, Orpah thought for a while and she turned back. And the woman said to Ruth, your sister-in-law's gone back. She's gone back to her family. She's gone back to her gods. Go back with her. And Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you or to return from following after you. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Here was commitment. The word return here is the word that is used so frequently in the, in the Old Testament. A word that, when you read the word repent in the Old Testament, normally is derived from the same word, at least in most cases. Don't ask me to repent from following you. That's what Ruth's saying. Don't ask me to repent from following you. Don't ask me to return from following after you. You see, to repent means to, to turn, or to return, to return to God, turn away from the world, and to turn toward God. It has to do with a change of direction. Now, there's a process that is expounded of repentance. Remember, to repent 
is a is an important key if we're going to receive the Holy Spirit, the means by which that the critical thirst can ultimately be quenched. The book of Hosea, chapter fourteen. In Hosea chapter 14, in verse 1, it says, O Israel, return unto the Lord your God, for you have fallen by your iniquity. The term return here is the same Hebrew term. means to return, to repent. O Israel, return unto the Lord your God. That's what it means to repent. It means to return to God. It means to turn around and go the other way. So the need to repent. For you have fallen by your iniquity. Take with you words and turn to the Lord. Say unto him, take away all, my, all iniquity and receive us graciously. So will we render the sacrifice of our lips. So the first step, as we start out in verse 1, has to do with a change of direction. That we start turning around trying to go the other way with our lives. The second thing has to do with what we say, because you see, you can't just... Straighten yourself out. It's not a matter of pick yourself up by your own bootstraps. You, you, you know, there's no way that any of us can ever work on anything we don't see. You can't work on a problem that you don't see. And, and frankly, it takes a miracle for God to show us ourselves and to show us not merely what we've done, but what we are. And to show us what's at the root and core. Those are things that are not just humanly discerned. It takes God's help. But just just to, to uh, for somebody to say, well, you need to change. Well, that's great. Change what? You know, your car is not working. And somebody says, well, you know, the thing is broken. Uh, well, that's fine. You, you knew that. Uh, you know, you, you can't get it to, you can't get it turned on. Or if you do, it sits there and, and, and uh, you know, sounds like a, uh, an animal factory or something. And, and so you know you've got problems. Nobody needed to tell you that. You, you were able to figure that out. and have to be particularly discerning uh, to, to arrive at that particular conclusion. The question is not, do you have a problem? The question is not, something needs to be fixed. The question is what? You know, you pull your car up and the thing, uh, thing's clanging and sounds like a, uh, like I say, like an animal factory. And somebody looks and says, you know, it's got rust spots all over it. What we need to do is paint this car. All right, it looks a lot better, you know. You can stain it down with a little Bondo in, uh, body by Bondo here, and, and, and get it all uh, uh, all fixed up. And, and uh, you know, paint it up, wax it, make it look really sharp. But well, it's still banging and clean. That wasn't the problem. It may look a lot better on the outside. And so, well, you know, tires look kind of... Uh, they, they don't look too good. Uh, you got, uh, I don't have any tread left. Uh, you know, what we need is new tires. Great. Right? It's kind of dirty here, you know, let's, let's uh, uh, you know, we'll vacuum the seats out and everything. That's all well really and good, but none of it solved the problem. This car is going to go. He still won't go. Maybe it looks a little better sitting in the driveway. <laughs> you know, you got it off the box and put it on new tires. But if you got to push it out of the way in order to mow the grass under it, you still haven't solved anything. You've got to identify the problem. you got to see it before you can do anything with it. Now, God is the one who stands ready to show us and to help us. He says, return to the Lord your God. You've fallen by your iniquity. Take with you words. And it, what, you, what words? Well, what you do is you say to him, take away all the iniquity. Receive us graciously. You pray and you ask God for mercy. You entreat him to help you. You go to him, rendering the sacrifice of our lips, prayer. Verse 3, answer shall not save us. We will not ride upon horses, neither will we say any more to the work of our hands. You are our gods, for in you the fatherless, in you the true God, the fatherless find mercy. The real help comes from God. It doesn't come from broken sisters. See? Verse 3 is, is the recognition that false strategies don't work, depending on uh, some, some human power that, that uh, uh, you, you know, it's just a matter that uh, this or that is going to... Uh, to be it. That's not the source. 
So we have to come to a recognition and, and an awareness of, of powerlessness, the fact that we can't change and transform ourselves. If we could, you and I can make ourselves okay of and by ourselves. What do we need God's Spirit for? What do we need the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for? What do we need God's mercy for? See, we can't fix ourselves nor can any other human being. We need more than a minor two of Coming to an awareness of that. We come to a point where we want to turn around and go the other way. We're ready to exchange our ways for God's way. We go to God and we ask Him for help and mercy. We beseech Him to show us and to help us and to be merciful to us. We have an awareness that what we need goes far beyond what we can do for ourselves or any other human being can do for us. And what does God say verse 4? I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely. My anger is turned away from him. I'll love him freely. You know, God wants to love us. God does love us. He wants us to understand and to recognize that. God desires to accept and to embrace us, to draw us to himself. He says, I'll heal their backsliding and I'll love them freely. Verse 5, I'll be as the dew unto Israel. He shall grow as the and cast, cast forth his roots as Lebanon. His branches shall spread and his beauty shall be as the olive tree. His smell as Lebanon and they that dwell under his shadow shall return. They'll revive as the corn and grow as the vine and the scent thereof shall be as the wine of Lebanon. God says, I'll heal. I'll be as the dew to Israel. I'll quench that thirst. I'll provide those needs. I'll fill those longings. The process of repentance, the process of return is described right here in Hosea 14. You know, in Colossians chapter 3, we're told in chapter 3 verse 1, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. So it's a matter of our thoughts, our affections, our loyalty, our allegiance, our devotion. If we're risen with Christ, then our affections need to be set on something far above that far transcends the right here, right now. For if you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God, when Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil desire or concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience. So it has to do with changing what we're doing. See, verse 5 has to do with changes in actions. But in verse 8, we're told now, put off. He starts out by talking about changes in, 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 uh, in actions, but he also goes beyond that and goes into changes of the way we think and feel. See, covetousness has to do with the way we think and feel on the inside. Evil desire has to do with the way we think and feel on the inside. So we're going to have to put to death, we're going to have to starve out the wrong actions, thoughts, and feelings. He says in verse 8, Now you have also put off all these. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, guilty communication out of your mouth. So it has to do with getting rid of the old way of thinking and feeling and acting. But you see, that has to start with a change in our orientation. It has to do with a change in our direction. It has to do with coming to a point of desiring and wanting, recognizing our desire and our longing for what God has. Realizing that all the substitutes are not going to quench the thirst. They're simply broken cisterns. They can't hold the water to quench the thirst. The needs we have go beyond the things that, that are going to be met or filled 
in those ways. All the false strategies are not going to solve the problem. You can't fill a spiritual void with a physical substance. And it can be any number of things. What we have to do, verse 10, is put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. The new man is renewed in knowledge. You see, it has to do with a new way of thinking. It has to do with a new set of beliefs. It has to do with a new way of thinking, which produces a new way of feeling. We start changing with what we're doing. We go to God for the help to change the way we think and feel. Because you see, you and I can't change what's deep down inside. But God can and will if he's thought. He offers that help. He offers that we can come and drink of the waters of the fountain of life. To drink freely. Oh, him that is thirsty, come and drink freely of the waters of life. Isaiah 55. Revelation 7, 16. Revelation 7, 16. We're told the time describing here the saints after the resurrection And it describes a time when they'll stand before God in verse 16. They'll hunger no more, neither thirst anymore. Neither shall the sun light on them or any heat for the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of water. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There is coming a time when that deepest longing those deepest longings that we have as human beings, those critical longings that nothing physical can fill, the time is coming when those, when that thirst will finally be quenched. God gives us now his spirit by measure. The time is coming when we will be able to freely drink of the water's fountain of life. Revelation 21, in verse 1, John talks about seeing a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. That's over with. He that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Right, for these words are true and faithful. He said unto me, it is done, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning of the, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is thirsty of the fountain of the water of life freely. That time is going to come, brethren, it really is. The solution is not to build cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold the water. It is to tap in to the fountains of living water. The power to transform us from the inside out. Not simply an external conformity, not simply an emotional experience, not merely trying to fill a void, uh, whether to, with, with pills or booze to dull the pain, or materialistic self-indulgence, or preoccupation with self in some uh, form or fashion or fad of, of, of today, but to recognize that deep down inside, there is that thirst, there is that need, there is that critical longing, that desire that God talks about, but he, all, he, he offers the key, the way by which that need can be met. And the time is going to come when we can tap in and drink of the waters of the fountain of life freely. In Revelation chapter 22 and verse 1, He showed me a pure river of the water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the midst 
of the street, and on either side of the river was a tree of life that had twelve manner of fruit. Mercifully, there was no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they will see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There'll be no night there, no need for candle or for the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. He said unto me, These things are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. Behold, I come quickly, blessed is he that keeps the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Coming on down, in verse 16, Jesus said, I have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. Verse 17, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. Let him that hears say, Come. And let him that is thirsty, Come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life free. God holds out to us that promise. We have a chance to be in as a part of the very first fruits. We have a, tra- a chance to be a part of the very beginning, the threshold, the first fruits of the accomplishments of God's plan. God holds out to us the opportunity to partake of His Spirit. And He holds out to us the time when ultimately as God Himself dwells with us and we with Him. As he says unto us, Come, if you're thirsty, come. Come, whosoever will, and let him take of the waters of life, free, never thirsty.